evening, a federal judge today ordered the New York Times to suspend temporarily publication of a series of reports based on a secret Pentagon study of how the United States became involved in the Vietnamese War. At the pinnacle of the Vietnam War, when government secrecy clashed with the public's right to know, the landmark Supreme Court case New York Times versus United States set a precedent for press freedom that resonates around the globe to this day. This documentary dives deep into the courtroom battle and the seismic ripple effects it had on journalism, democracy, and the very fabric of American society. Before we begin, hit that like and subscribe button, or else the Pentagon Papers might reveal that your favorite video is classified. In June 1971, the air in the newsroom of the New York Times was thick with tension and the weight of a monumental discovery. A classified study, thousands of pages long, lay sprawled on tables and in the hands of astounded journalists. The Pentagon Papers, as they came to be known, were more than just paper and ink. They were a stark map of U.S. military involvement in Vietnam, stretching back to the 1940s and painting a devastatingly different picture from the one presented to the American public. At the center of this unfolding drama stood Daniel Ellsberg, a former military analyst who, with a troubled conscience, had come to the conclusion that the American people deserved to know the truth. Ellsberg risked everything to ensure that the secret history of the Vietnam War didn't stay secret any longer. It was he who had painstakingly photocopied and passed these documents to the New York Times. This wasn't just a massive compendium of reports and memos. These papers shed light on a series of presidential administrations and their military actions, unearthing truths about decisions that had led to the escalation of the war in Vietnam, all hidden from public scrutiny. Revelations included the Truman administration's support for France against Vietnamese independence movements, the hidden motives surrounding the Gulf of Tonkin resolution under Lyndon B. Johnson, and the collective silence over the unlikelihood of success that spanned years and multiple presidencies. The documents suggested a pattern of deception, where consecutive administrations had misled or lied to not only the American public, but also Congress about the Vietnam War's progress and the effectiveness of its strategies. It was clear to the journalists poring over the paperwork. The implications were explosive, and providing the broader context for the war would profoundly shake the nation's trust in its leaders. The decision to publish wasn't taken lightly. The New York Times knew that releasing government secrets of this magnitude could have serious ramifications. The country was about to witness a confrontation that would ask whether the public's right to know could override alleged risks to national security a question that would resonate well beyond the confines of a newspaper office or the pages of a secret study and would soon command the attention of the Supreme Court. For the journalists involved, this was more than just a scoop. It was a direct challenge to the boundaries of the First Amendment, a test of the fundamental freedoms that define the nation. Little did they know that their choices in the coming days would shape the future of journalism and redefine the balance of power between the press and the government. Moments after the New York Times published its first explosive article on the Pentagon Papers, the White House reacted with fury. President Nixon's administration, determined to plug the leak and stop what they saw as a flagrant breach of national security, earned to the courts. Their weapon of choice was a temporary restraining order, which they hoped would muzzle the press and prevent any further damage to the government's standing. The Department of Justice argued that the disclosure of these classified documents would cause an immediate and irreparable harm to the United States, particularly to its national defense interests and foreign policy. They insisted that the right of the public to be informed was outweighed by the need to protect the sanctity of state secrets. The New York Times resisted, defending their decision to publish as an exercise of free press guaranteed by the First Amendment. To the journalists and editors involved, this was a clear-cut case of the public's need to know taking precedence over the government's desire for secrecy. The question that began to emerge was profound and complex. Could the government restrain the press from publishing information that was vital to the public's understanding of its own history? The legal battle that ensued was swift and fierce. The Times found itself before the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, with the eyes of the nation watching closely. On the one hand was the government, claiming authority and protection of nation's interest. On the other was the press, standing firm on the foundational principles of democracy and transparency. Judge Murray Gerfin, presiding over the case, faced a daunting task. In an atmosphere charged with political tension and the stakes higher than any case in recent memory, he had to decide whether the prior restraint of the press was justified. On June 15, only three days after the publication of the Pentagon Papers began, Judge Gerfine rendered his decision. The restraining order was extended, 
and the country inhaled sharply. It became clear that this battle over the freedom of the press would not be settled quietly or quickly. The case was on a fast track to the highest court in the country, hurtling towards a legal showdown that would become a defining moment in the annals of American jurisprudence. The courtroom became the arena for a legal and philosophical struggle that cut to the very core of the American Constitution. The First Amendment declared the freedom of the press to be a right held sacred, protecting journalists from government censorship, a concept known as prior restraint. This case, New York Times versus United States, now asked whether this freedom was absolute, especially when national security was invoked. The government's case hinged on the contention that it had the right to shield certain information in the interest of the nation's safety. They maintained that the Pentagon Papers contained sensitive data, which, if published widely, could jeopardize international relations and even endanger lives. They called upon the court to uphold their duty to protect these secrets, even at the cost of press freedom. On the other side stood the defense, the New York Times, and later the Washington Post, which had also begun to publish the documents. These newspapers claimed that the term national security was being misused, that the actual content of the Pentagon Papers posed no real-time threat but revealed instead a pattern of deception. They argued that the American public had a right to be fully informed, especially when the information related to government decisions that deeply affected the nation and the lives of countless individuals serving in Vietnam. Central to the argument was the concept of a free and unencumbered press, a bedrock for accountability and governance, which the papers believed trumped the government's claims. This was about more than the Pentagon Papers. This was about whether the government could ever stop the press from publishing information it deemed necessary for the public to know and where that boundary would lie. The tension between a government's need for confidentiality and the public's right to information was laid bare. And as the arguments traversed the complexities of the law, the courts had to consider historical intention against modern-day reality. Could the phrases penned by the Founding Fathers withstand the test of time and conflict? The debate soared beyond the courtroom, capturing the nation's attention. As the legal tides turned and churned, the case quickly ascended through the legal hierarchy, making its way inevitably to the solemn chambers of the United States Supreme Court. The constitutional issue at hand was about to be dissected by the highest legal minds in the land. The hushed gravity of the United States Supreme Court's chamber was palpable as nine justices deliberated the fate of the First Amendment in the context of national security. The tense nation waited for a judgment that would not only affect the New York Times, but also the very fabric of American democracy. And then the ruling came. By a decision of 6-3, the court sided with the newspapers. It was a landmark victory for the press. The government's attempt to impose prior restraint on the New York Times was deemed unconstitutional. The majority opinion, though fragmented with several concurring statements, sent a clear message. A heavy presumption against prior restraint remained the bedrock principle safeguarding a free press in the United States. Justice Hugo Black, in his concurring opinion, championed an almost absolute interpretation of the First Amendment. He unambiguously declared that the government had no power to restrict the press from publishing information, emphasizing that a free press had been intended by the founders to serve as a check on governmental power. Justice William O. Douglas concurred with Black, fiercely advocating for a vigilant and uninhibited press, one that could freely scrutinize and criticize government actions without fear of retribution or censorship. Their staunch views on press freedom echoed through their written words and resonated with the public. Even though the court did not give the New York Times and the Washington Post unfettered freedom to publish, as there were complex opinions with nuances addressing potential limitations in extraordinary circumstances, the thrust of the majority was to underscore the essential role of the press in a democracy. The dissenting justices warned of potential ramifications, suggesting that the release of such material could endanger national security. However, the prevailing belief among the majority rose above the apprehension, the integrity of the nation's democratic processes, and the need for an informed citizenry prevailed. As the gavel struck, it signaled far more than the end of a hearing. It was a reaffirmation of the Founders' vision, a bold proclamation that the press must remain free to inform the people, especially about the workings and missteps of government. The Supreme Court had not only made a decision in a case, but it had also made a statement about American values. In the wake of the Supreme Court's decision, a new chapter in the history of the American free press began. The ruling did not just uphold the rights of the New York Times and the Washington Post, but it resoundingly protected the fourth estate's role as the ever-vigilant watchdog of democracy, guarding against the encroachment of governmental power.
Media outlets across the country felt the tremors of this judicial affirmation. In the judgment's wake, journalists experienced a renewed sense of purpose and responsibility. The decision had drawn a clear line in the sand. There were strict limitations on the government's ability to use prior restraint as a means to silence the press. The courts had signaled that the truth, especially when it pertained to the actions of those in power, was something that needed respect and protection. Yet the Supreme Court's ruling also brought to the fore the immense responsibility that lay with the free press in exercising its power judiciously. The media was reminded that with great power came great accountability, a duty to wield their freedom with precision, care, and integrity, ensuring that national security was not compromised capriciously. The message resonated internationally as well reinforcing the United States' commitment to press freedom and inspiring journalists and lawmakers around the globe. It became a touchstone for debates on freedom of information and the public's right to know, sending ripples through discussions on government transparency and accountability worldwide. But amidst this celebratory note, there was an understanding that the struggle between the press and the government would not end here. The balance between protecting the national interest and ensuring a free and independent press was delicate and constant. Yet, on this historic occasion, the scales had tipped in favor of a free press, marking a consequential affirmation that freedom of the press, as enshrined in the First Amendment, was not just an ideal to be upheld in theory, but a reality to be lived and protected. Decades have passed since the Supreme Court's decision in New York Times versus United States, yet the echoes of this case are as loud today as they were back in 1971. In an era where information moves at the speed of light and leaks are disseminated across the globe in seconds, the fundamental issues confronted in this case remain vitally relevant. The digital age has ushered in new challenges and a new frontier for press freedom. Whistleblowers and publishers now use powerful technology to expose government secrets, often eliciting reactions that hark back to the Pentagon Papers controversy. In the high-stakes environment of global politics and security, the media's role in balancing government accountability and operational secrecy has become increasingly complex. As recent events involving classified intelligence and the rapid dissemination of information show, the questions raised by the Pentagon Papers case continue to resonate. Government surveillance programs, the prosecution of individuals under the Espionage Act, and the ethical responsibilities of news organizations in the publication of sensitive information draw direct lines back to the heart of this legal milestone. The principles established in New York Times versus United States remain touchstones for these debates, relied upon by courts, journalists, and advocates when wrestling with modern dilemmas of privacy, security, and the public interest. The ruling's reinforcement of the First Amendment rights sets a legal precedent that creates an environment where the media can challenge government actions and advocate for transparency. In this ever-evolving landscape, the delicate balance between national security and the public's right to know continues to be tested. Governments and media institutions alike must navigate this terrain, each with an awareness of the weighty precedent that casts a long shadow over their actions. The ongoing relevance of this case underlines how the seminal battles fought between the media and the government in the 20th century laid the groundwork for the complex legal and ethical conversations of today. It reminds us that these freedoms, though protected, must be actively upheld by each generation, in every medium, and against new and unforeseen challenges. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the landmark Supreme Court case New York Times v. United States. This case continues to resonate in today's world, reminding us of the delicate balance between national security and the public's right to know. We hope you found this documentary informative and thought-provoking. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons to stay updated on our future videos.